This short video just provides a very quick introduction to delay lock loops so you can see the basic premise of their operation. Here is a simple sketch of a delay lock loop. Now, whereas a phase lock loop is trying to adjust the frequency of a oscillator so that its phase precisely matches that of a reference input, in this case, a delay lock loop is just adjusting the delay through a path of inverters to match an integer number of periods of an input clock. So you might wonder why such a thing is so useful. Uh, first of all, notice that it doesn't naturally perform any frequency synthesis. The clock remains at the same frequency at all points in this delay line. But what it does do is it produces delayed copies of the input clock. And assuming these delay stages are matched, it produces evenly spaced in time copies of the input, evenly spread across an integer number of clock periods. We say that this simple DLL will lock at an integer number of clock periods because if the loop is stable, the assumption is that the input to the phase detector here would be zero. That is, that there would be zero phase difference between the input clock and this delayed version of the input clock. So if there's zero phase difference between these two versions of the clock, it must mean that through this path, the clock is experiencing an integer number of clock periods of delay. So this can be quite useful. You've got a bunch of copies of the clock all uniformly spaced across an integer number of clock periods. So this gives you, for example, quadrature phases, or even more than quadrature phases. Um, moreover, the other thing that DLL produces is the control voltage that is required to produce such a delay. So you can make use of this control voltage, or it may be a control current, depending on the implementation of these delay circuits. You can make use of that delay volt, that, that control voltage or current in copies of these buffer circuits and delay other signals elsewhere in your system by the exact same amount labeled here, tau. This can be really useful because you have no uh, equivalent to a band gap reference for time in an integrated circuit. There's nothing in silicon that has units of seconds that is very, very constant across PVT. But as soon as you have a reference clock, which maybe is derived from a precision crystal or other resonator off chip, now you have something that has units of time that is very precise. And using a DLL, you can use that to create circuits, delay circuits that also have a precise delay time tau that is deterministically related to the period of that reference clock, which is in turn related to the resonant frequency of this off chip resonator. So DLLs uh, are very useful. Now, next, let's think about what a linear model for this might look like. So we've got a phase detector here. So that's going to take the difference between the phase of these two input clock signals. And there's a charge pump there. So together, these blocks will have some gain. That is, depending on the phase difference between the two incoming clocks, it will produce an output current proportional to the phase there and the constant proportionality is some gain constant KPD. And then we've got an output current here whose average value is proportional to the phase error. And that's then integrated on this capacitor. So it sees an impedance one over SC giving rise then to, uh, so we can think of that as being the model for this whole thing. And that then gives rise to a signal B control, which is applied to the delay line. And these buffers will have some relationship between the control voltage that comes into them and the delay that they generate. So if we assume that that relationship is approximately linear, we can define a gain constant, let's call it KDL which has units of seconds or radians per volt that relates the control voltage or changes in the control voltage to changes in the delay through that path. 
Now, that varying delay, a uh, key point here is that varying delay arises at um, the phase detector, not immediately, but uh, we have to wait for the input clock to propagate through this chain, which has a delay of n tau for n delay stages in series. So there's an additional uh, term in our linear model here that has to be accounted for that accounts for the delay through this delay line. So we can model a continuous time delay with a term like this, e to the negative s n tau. So just to recap briefly, the output of the charge pump is integrated onto this capacitor. The resulting control voltage experiences a gain, KDL, and then the resulting phase change arises at the phase detector input some time delay later. And once there, it is compared to the input phase. So this uh, linearized sketch here has gotten quite messy. So let's clean it up and use that uh, to discuss the loop dynamics. So here's a redrawn and slightly reorganized linear model of the DLL that makes it a little bit more clear what's going on. A first thing to point out here is that unlike a PLL, there's only one integrator in this loop. Remember the PLL has one integrator happening where the charge pump current is integrated onto a capacitor and another integrator that arises inside the VCO because the control voltage controls the frequency of the VCO and the phase at the output of the VCO is the integral of its frequency. So that as a result, where PLLs are type two loops, that is there's two integrators in a loop, which requires uh, a sort of addition of that resistor in the loop filter to stabilize the type two loop. On the other hand, DLLs have only one integrator in the loop. As such, they're a type one negative feedback loop. And with only one integrator in the loop, obviously there's only 90 degrees phase shift, neglecting for the time being this delay term. It's only 90 degrees phase shift through this loop. So stability is guaranteed. Now a detailed analysis of the loop dynamics here is provided in this paper from 2003. So I'll refer you to that for the details. But in summary, unlike a PLL, the jitter transfer characteristic here is all pass. And this, shouldn't really be surprising because ultimately all the clock waveforms that arise in the DLL are simply delayed versions of the input clock. So any jitter that arises on the input clock is going to appear at all the delayed copies of the input. However, at some frequencies that jitter can actually be amplified. Because of the delay through the loop, the DLL acting to try to correct the phase uh, of the clock can actually result in some constructive interference of jitter at some frequencies. And so, again, the rigorous analysis is presented in the reference in the top right, but the net of it is that at some frequencies, you can see amplification of phase noise from the input to the output of the DLL. Um, now, the amount of peaking that's exhibited can be reduced by reducing the loop bandwidth of this DLL. So here's a quick example of the utility of a delay lock loop in a real application. Imagine that you're communicating data across uh, a link between chips, and you're also forwarding a clock from one chip to the other. Now at some point, the chip on the right is going to have to capture the incoming data with some latches. But if the data is arriving at very high speed, the clock that's applied to these latches has to be very precisely aligned to the data. In general, you can't just rely on matching between the clock and data paths to ensure the precise arrival time of the clock relative to the data. After all, the clock here may be at a lower frequency than the data to save power and therefore may have to go through an integer and PLL, uh, which is going to incur some phase shift and uh, so then some circuitry is needed to realign the clock to the incoming data. This is where the DLL comes in. We know that a DLL can accept as its input this clock and produce many phase shifted copies of that clock, clock spread across the full clock period. What's then left is for some control circuitry to decide which of these uniformly spaced clocks 
is best suited to sample the incoming data. Now, if you would like to have very precise control over the timing of this clock, as again is often the case in very high speed lengths, then just using the DLL on its own may not provide enough precision. The precision in selecting the phase of the output of the DLL is limited by how short a delay time the buffers inside the DLL provide. If you want finer time resolution than that, you'll often see the many clock phases coming out of the DLL apply to what's called a phase interpolator, which selects two neighbor, any two neighboring phases from the DLL according to some phase select control words and can even interpolate between those phases. And the circuitry required to do that is obviously quite critical. Briefly, here are a couple examples of phase interpolator circuits in CMOS. Shown on the left is the simple CMOS phase interpolator made out of inverters. So imagine you've got two clocks with different phases but the same frequency coming in at phi A and phi B here. The clock that arises at phi B on the right here is simply a delayed version of the input. Likewise, the output here, the lowercase phi a on the right, is a delayed version of the input phi a. So the phase difference between phi a and b at the output here is the same as the phase difference between the inputs phi a and b on the left. But this middle path is being driven by two inverters switching at slightly different times. One switches with the edges of the input phi A, the other switches with the edges of the other input phi B. So you get a waveform at this node here that looks something like this, that whichever inverter switches first will give rise to a relatively slow change in the output node here, this intermediate node here. And then when the second inverter changes a short time later, labeled TD in this waveform sketch, then the node will start transitioning much faster because now you've got both inverters acting to pull down the node. Whereas this first part of the waveform here, you had only one inverter pulling down and the other inverter was still pulling up this intermediate node. So the time of the transition that's observed on this intermediate node is somewhere between the time of the transition observed here and here. So usually this second stage of buffers is used to just clean up the waveform. As you can imagine, it's a little bit messy at this internal node. And in best case scenario, with good matching everywhere, what you end up with is three equally spaced clock phases at the output. So this output here is interpolating the phase between phi A and phi B. And you can actually see a delay between neighboring pairs of clock waveforms here that's less than the delay time of a single inverter. You can imagine then you can use uh, MUX here to select any one of these clock waveforms here and that's one way you can make a phase interpolator. Shown on the right is what's called a CML or current mode logic phase interpolator. This one works on a little different principle. The input waveform is assumed to be a little bit more sinusoidal and an in-phase and quadrature clock, that is two clocks that are shifted by 90 degrees with respect to each other, are blended according to the values of these tail currents, I1, I2, I3, and I4. So depending on which of these tail current magnitudes is largest, you will end up with an output phase here that is uh, approximately equal to that input clock phase. But if you have two tail currents active at the same time, for example, I4 and I2 active at the same time, what you end up with at the output is a sort of a interpolation or blend between clock I and clock Q. And by varying the tail currents accordingly, you can get clock phases at the output that are anywhere between zero and 90 degrees. And then by using different polarities of differential pairs, you can reach all other quadrants uh, 
of the phase shift of the output clock here. You can interpolate between 90 and 180, 180 and 270, 270 and 360 degrees, and thereby get any clock phase at the output. This is an example implementation of such a CMOS phase interpolator. And the trick here lies really in adjusting the tail currents I1 to I4 so as to achieve a nice uniform phase interpolation at the output here.